Hey everybody, welcome back to Mr. Misfits. I'm kind of here now. Brandon's still here. Well, he's not even here, but Brandon's still there. That's right. I'm. Last week, I was not even able to walk. This week, I'm at least able to walk, but the rest of my family can't. So we're still separated out for at least today. But we're back. We're going to be be getting ready here for what's coming up in the next, uh, what, next week, actually, right? Next week. Yeah, we'll, is, we'll be starting uh, pretty soon here with 12 Days of Misfits. Yeah, yes, so if, if, you, if you missed it last year, you may be okay with that because it wasn't, I don't, did, did we actually do 12 days or did we end up doing 13 or did we skip a day? I don't know. You know how math works around here. But anyway, today this this year we actually mapped it out on a calendar instead of just assuming that we knew how many days there were in December. So, starting December 13th, going to December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, we're doing the 12 days of misfits again. We've got I've got 12 new passages for Brandon. I finally found a 12th one because I was stuck on 11 for a while, but we found number 12. We're ready to do this thing, and so that'll start next week. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, from December 13th through the 24th, we will be releasing a mini episode every day where Brandon is going to test his Christmas and Bible knowledge and see if he can figure out why these passages are Christmas passages, even though we never use them as Christmas passages. Yeah, it should be fun. Yes, and these are ones that you probably want to watch the video for even more so than listen to because it's real fun watching Brandon's head spin after about the second verse that he's reading. And like, I think he's just pulling random things out and these actually have nothing to do with what we're talking about. (laughs) So check all that out. If you want to go back and see what we did last year, it's all up on YouTube. It's back in the, the catalog a little bit, like past episode 40, something like that. It's like, yeah. They're all in there. 12 Days of Misfits. It's coming up next week. But in the meantime, we're going to prepare for the 12 Days of Misfits by talking about the preparation for Christmas today. So, Brandon, what is the word that we use for the preparation before Christmas time? Yeah, so the word that we use typically is Advent. So that's what we're going to be getting into today and a little bit more of the origin of the name as you were talking about where uh, what it means kind of where it comes from potentially some history we always like to give a little history lesson if we can and then always as as christians what does this mean for us and and should we celebrate right so typically a christian calendar starts actually november 12th ish is where it normally starts if you depending on which part of christendom you come from it's either november 12th or sometime around november 30th that's the start of the liturgical year why because we are into advent the second half of the year is broken up with either the Lent period, which is awaiting Easter, or it's broken up at Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes down 40 days after Easter. So you've got all of these different periods that we break up to await the coming of a major event. Advent specifically is a Latin word that is talking about the arrival of some notable person. And in this case, who is that notable person, Brandon? (laughs) The easy answer here, Jesus. Jesus is half right. Because it's not just Jesus that we're waiting on. We're waiting on the Messiah. Specifically is what the idea behind this whole thing is. And to understand why that's important, we have to go back and look through Old Testament history a little bit. 
So in Genesis 1 and 2, God is walking with man, right? We're in the Garden mm-hmm. of Eden. Adam and Eve literally walking, talking, laughing with God. Then what happens in Genesis 3, Brandon? We have the um, sin entering the world. We screw up, and God no longer is going to walk with us. He can't walk with us because of our shame and our sin. But what does he promise? This is like the first one of the first ones we did last year for the 12 Days of Misfits. What is it that God promises there in Genesis 3? Um, you're going to get me again on this one. I know. We said that if we did the same questions, you probably would still get the same results. So now we're <laughs> testing the theory. He would provide um, someone to take take away the sins. He promises the Messiah, right? The yes, mes- you essentially. Know, some, a descendant of Eve that his heel will be struck by the serpent and the descendant will stomp his head, right? The Messiah is coming. Then after Genesis 3, we have periods of different covenants. You've got Noah, you've got Abram, you've got Isaac, you've got Jacob, you've got David. All of these different covenants that are coming in. And in between some of these different covenants, you have these different periods. So you have 400 years where the Hebrews are slaves in Egypt awaiting a Messiah. Someday they are going to have a deliverer come and rescue them from the oppression of Egypt. And who is that little M Messiah, Brandon? Be Christ Jesus. No, Moses, right? Moses is the one that comes and rescues the people out of Egypt, right? God sends uh, well, well, Moses in. In fact, what, what was your question again? I misheard that then. I, I, I said, who is the little M Messiah? that comes and rescues the people out of bondage in Egypt. Mm, okay. Now that makes more Moses sense. Moses <laughs> is the one that comes yeah. in and, and rescues them out of Egypt, right? Yes. And then the people mess up again. Moses messes up also. And now you have another period of waiting, this time for 40 years, of wandering in the desert awaiting the promised land. And then after they get in, you have this period of time with the judges and the kings and the prophets. And then you have a period of 70 years in exile in Babylon, awaiting again a Messiah to come and rescue them from their oppressors. And this time that little M Messiah, Cyrus the Great, comes Mm, in and he, he defeats Babylon without even really doing anything. He just walks in under the city and takes out Belshazzar and in the process becomes king of the world. Eventually he goes and he frees all of the exiles and allows them to return to Judah. But then after they try and return, they rebuild the temple, they rebuild the walls And then there is 400 years of silence from God. There's no prophets. There's no judges. There's just different periods of foreign invaders taking over. Persia has their hand on them for a while. The Greeks come in and have their hand on them for a while. And then Rome eventually comes in and has their their hand on them for a while. But that 400 years of silence is spent awaiting for the big M Messiah that was promised in Genesis 3 to finally come and finally free the people from their chains of bondage and sin, not just physical oppression. And that 400 years is broke with the birth of who? Of Christ Jesus. Of actually of John the Baptist, right? He's a prophet now. There's somebody here proclaiming the word of the Lord again. But who is it that John the Baptist prepares the way for? <laughs> Jesus, the big M Messiah. So we did get there eventually. Yes. But this is why Advent is more specifically than just awaiting Jesus. 
it's awaiting the promised Messiah that was promised all the way back in Genesis 3. Yeah. So we're going to take a break and let Brandon's head calm down for a second. And then we're going to actually start breaking down what the season is, why we celebrate it, and what this all actually has to do with anything. <laughs> We'll be right back. Season two of the Ministry Misfits podcast and our awesome theme song are brought to you by Laird Creative Agency. In our social media world, the next connection is always one click or scroll away and your business has to be ready when they find you. That's why Laird Creative is always looking for ways to step your brand up. Whether you're looking to overhaul your brand one time with a new website or want to save money by outsourcing your graphic and media content, Laird Creative Agency is here to help. Laird Creative's mission is to take the difficulty out of the creative process. With Laird Creative, you'll find a dedicated team of artists ready to tackle any creative need that your business has, big or small. If you're looking for an easier way to share the vision of your organization through thoughtful branding and creative content, find them at LairdCreativeAgency.com to get started. Mention the Ministry Misfits podcast and get a free consultation call. Laird Creative, step your brand up. Today is a great day to start your own podcast. Whether you're looking for a new marketing channel, have a message you want to share with the world, or just think it would be fun to have your own talk show, podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your online reach. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online listed on all major platforms within minutes of finishing your first recording. We just switched to Buzzsprout for Season 2 and have immediately noticed the difference. With Buzzsprout, you get a great-looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into your websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners, and Buzzsprout and the Misfits want to help you get started. Contact us for a free consultation call, and then visit our affiliate link to get started with Buzzsprout. Using this link not only helps support the Misfits, but it also gets you a $20 Amazon gift card. The teams at Buzzsprout and Ministry Misfits are passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. To find out more, go to www.ministrymisfits.com backslash affiliates. We're back. All right, welcome back. We're still here. Brandon has sorted out his thoughts and already issued <laughs> complaints about doing Merry Misfitting next week. But we're back. We're talking Advent. Before we went to break, we w- walked through the biblical history for what this season actually is about. And it's the awaiting of the promised Messiah because we had a 400 year period from the end of the canonic- canonical Old Testament. And the the announcement that John the Baptist was going to be born, where it seemed like God had just kind of abandoned everybody and just let them kind of do their thing. Now, we have other miracles recorded between Josephus and the Maccabees and everything else, but there was not a singular prophet that had come and that was spreading the news of the messiah coming so we obviously now this side of christmas understand the messiah has come and so there's another aspect of it for us that we're going to talk about in a little bit but before that we're going to talk about what this actually is the season of advent not just what it represents so depending on what church you go to you're going to have different answers for all of this. And Brandon and I were talking during the break about the fact that if you're colorblind like me, you're going to have even more explanations of it than even what most normal people actually do. (laughs) (laughs) So if you are a Protestant, 
most likely your season of Advent falls be somewhere between November 27th, December 3rd as the starting point. Because, again, our calendars never actually are the same. And it ends yeah, like, every year, though, on Christmas Eve. Because yeah, like the, for this year, we've got November 27th through the 24th. Now, the importance of the start date has nothing to do with the number of days. That's what we have with Lent. It's always 40 days from the start of Lent to Easter. But within Advent, that's not what we've got. Within Advent, it's about the number of Sundays from that moment until Christmas comes. Now, within the Roman Catholic Church, it typically falls on the Sunday that is closest to November 30th and ends on Christ's Mass, which is where we get the word for Christmas. Christmas. Christmas is Christ's Mass within Catholicism. That's what it, we that's what it's all marking down to is the big the big celebration of Christ's mass on Christmas. Within other areas of orthodoxy, Advent begins on the 6th Sunday before Christmas and goes all the way up to Christmas Day, and it typically is November 12th, somewhere around there coinciding with St. Martin's feast. And so the time of Advent is similar to Lent, where it's supposed to be a time of fasting in preparation for the Messiah coming. Now, Brandon, do we ever actually talk about Advent in a way of fasting, at least in Western culture? Typically not. Like you said, it's more associated with Lent if it's going to be around that time period. Um, it's usually more of a celebration period, if anything. Right. We have almost the opposite of fasting because throughout the Christmas season is Easter. when there's a lot a lot of money being spent on on gifts and on decorations. I mean, if you if you've driven by my neighbor's house at all for over the past month and a half. There's not much fasting going on with the amount of lights that are coming off of his house and shining into our, our house. Although yesterday, Brandon, the uh, the reindeer that are out front had a little accident with the wind, the wind decapitated Rudolph. But that <laughs> that sort of a thing is not normally associated with what we talk about in the period of Advent. There's feasts going on. People are baking cookies and candies and there's gifts that are being bought. And Belden Village, for those of you that are local, is a no man's land that you don't want to go into. That's not what we ever associate when we talk about a period of fasting. But it is still a period of preparation. And so there are some different traditions that come out of the Advent period that help us with preparation for the Messiah's coming or remembering about the Messiah coming. So Brandon, what kind of traditions do we normally see within Advent? Um, one of them, the most traditional probably within the church is the Advent candles or the Advent wreath. Yes. Yeah. And kind of what there's one other big one that is just in general for this time of year, which is just greenery in general. And yep. all of them have very specific reasons why we use them. None of them are anything that we actually have ever really seen being put down on paper by anybody of major importance as far as you need to do these and this is why. This is not some kind of symbolic thing of where if you don't do this, you're not participating within the worship. In fact, we don't even really have any real history as to where this whole thing started in the first place. Most people believe it was started by 480 AD and that it was all dealing with St. Martin's Feast. But it wavered through it without, throughout history as far as how popular it was, but it never really changed. There was always the ideas of wreaths and candles 
and greenery being used to celebrate and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. That is until Vatican II in 1962 with Pope John Paul II. And that is where there was a second meaning added to what Advent was all about. And Brandon, this is where I think you started getting very, very confused with the biblical history we were adding at the beginning. Because now, what is Advent about? It's not just awaiting the Messiah. It's about awaiting who? I I guess Jesus for the second coming, the second arrival. Jesus' second coming is also now what we are preparing for. And now this is where it gets kind of interesting because 1962 is not that long ago. That's when my dad was born. It's not a ancient practice to say, to be awaiting the second coming of Christ. And it's also interesting that we understand and have accepted that as part of it, even though that was coming out of the Vatican as the reason for the season type of thing. But yet we've all kind of agreed that, yeah, that is what we are waiting on. And that's part of what we celebrate within this spirit, the spirit and advent of Christmas is not only did God send him the Messiah in the person of Christ, but now we await for the return of the Messiah as Christ. So. Brandon, how do we actually go about doing this idea of the celebration? You already started talking about the wreaths and the candles and everything else. Why is it, and this this time we are going to do the buzzing and everything else, because this is stuff <laughs> that I think you already know and already have written down, but we're going to see. Why do we use wreaths? Uh, I think there would be a, there's a few probably different symbols f- that it represents um the first of which i was thinking of with the wreath being a circle so you very similar to a ring you have that con- beginning to end the alpha and omega um continuation of god yes why be one of them. are that why do we use why do we use greenery specifically and it's normally evergreens pines why do we use those? Uh, I did see there was somewhere like with the evergreens and even symbolism of symbolism of the pine cones of like life within that too represented, at least from what, depending upon the church. I think that was maybe okay, more. Okay, we'll go with that. That works. <laughs> I've not heard that, but we'll go with that. Yeah, they more, they really went more into ty- some of it. <laughs> yeah, more more typically, the idea is just the the fact that in the spirit in the the season that we are in, ge- geographically, of winter, at least the majority of or half the world is in winter. <laughs> Within winter, you have this season of death and decay, and yet there are still things that are showing signs of life specifically within evergreens. They never truly go Brown until you cut off their water source, which is what happens with most Christmas trees. When you forget about them, you know, <laughs> they, they stay, uh, they stay alive as long as they're connected to the source. So it's a both everlasting life and everlasting love. The pine cone side of it, kind of feeds into both so we'll go with it but i've never heard that before (laughs) yeah i felt like that one was more of a stretch on the take from what i was reading but i was like okay i guess if they want to add the pine cones in there they can now the bigger thing with that is associated with advent because this is the thing that's kind of funny is that you've got well we'll 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 come back to the candles actually in a minute we're going to stick on the evergreens part of this as well for a second Brent, what have have you heard the objections to actually doing the traditional Advent type stuff, especially related to evergreens? I have not, but I'm going to assume that it's something more associated to the Western church. 
No, actually. This is something that is more related to what we talked about back when we did the Halloween episode. Of the the thought behind it is that the traditions of Christmas, not Advent, but Christmas, are pagan in origin. Specifically, people focus in on Saturnalia, which actually happens in the middle of December, not towards the end, but they always ignore that part of it when they try to claim that this is the origin of the winter solstice and all these other things. And specifically, the verse that is used against Christmas trees is out of Jeremiah in chapter 10. I think it's 10, maybe 19. I'm getting the numbers confused. Numbers, you know how that goes. <laughs> in Jeremiah, where it talks about not putting silver onto trees and ordaining trees. So why then, Brandon, do we do that if it says in Jeremiah 10 not to, to ordain the trees? What is the actual problem that is being addressed in Jeremiah, do you think? I am not sure of the reason why that one would have been stated, honestly. Well, just think through this a little bit. What, what do we know about Jeremiah? Jeremiah is a prophet... He is speaking to the people and warning them about the coming exiles and the, the, the idolatry that is going on within the nation. And a lot of what he uses is heavy imagery to show all of these different things. But specifically, what would be the problem with dressing up the trees in the area in or in ordaining them with gold and silver and jewels and everything else. What is most likely going to happen if they're doing that? Most likely some sort of idolatry worship um, f from the symbolism. Right. They're, they're going and they're worshiping the trees. They're ordaining them and giving them gifts. And it talks about the fact that they're even being lifted out of the ground and carried around the city the same way that they do all the foreign gods. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about within Advent. But what people do is they take the one little verse and then they try to apply it to the entire season, which is why we started going back into what the actual idea behind Advent looks like within Scripture. It's a long awaiting of the promise that God put forth all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And so the season of Advent should be Christocentric. Everything should be centered on awaiting of the Messiah, the Christ, to be coming and to be coming on our behalf. And so in some ways, that verse in Jeremiah is actually relevant because we do have people that worship the season of Christmas more than they do the actual awaiting of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But the actions that we're talking about within Advent are not designed for that they're designed to center our focus back in on christ yep it can and be so, with anything there there can be a right. good or bad use to it right so we're going to talk now what the candles actually are because we already said the the evergreens are actually supposed to be centering us back on remembering the everlasting life and everlasting love that comes from being connected to the life source the life source being Jesus. This is why Jesus says, you know, he's the vine, we're the branches. It's all about this idea of being connected to him. So there are these candles now that we need to talk about. And they have, they represent the different aspects of the waiting period. So now this is where it's going to get very interesting as well, because we discovered during the break that I actually have zero clue what color any of these are. That 
Brandon has a much better understanding of what the colors actually are, but that depending on what denomination, what branch of Christendom you are a part of, the budget of your church even, the candles are going to look different <laughs> and the colors are going to be different and everything else. So we're using the more traditional recorded idea of what these candles look like. But what's more important is what they actually are representing, which also is debated depending on your denomination or anything else. So we're going to try and make this as broad as possible with the goal of after we do this, being able to explain why it matters in the first place. So, Brandon, there are five candles and we light one each Sunday leading up to Christmas. Yes what and is no. candle number? Yes and no, depending on who, you, which denomination you're a part of. What is the first candle? Well, I was going to clarify and say most would represent, which traditionally say four candles because you've got the four Sundays representing or up to Christmas Eve. And then you may or may not have the fifth candle kind of representing the birth of Christ. So... That's what I was going to say is not, it seems like not everybody always has the fifth candle represented in there, even though they should. Which we could argue, is it really Christocentric if it's not? But we're not going to argue that. We're just going to go with what, what these all represent. So week one, which would have been as we're recording this a week ago. Week one, what is that candle normally referred to as? Typically, that one is known as the Candle of Hope. Candle of Hope, or do you have the other two names? Um, the other one could be the Prophecy Candle. The Prophet's Hope, or the Messiah Candle. Because, again, it's marking the, awaital, the awaiting of the promised Messiah. All three of these names all are connected. The prophets represented hope for the people. The Messiah is what they were hoping for. Hope is what we were whole, are holding on to as we start this process, is that if we're going to go through the waiting, there's something we are waiting for. So all three are actually connected, even though we use the different names. Week two we ha is what candle, Brandon? That one's typically the candle of peace. Um, and that one can also be referred to sometimes as the Bethlehem candle. Bethlehem, yes. But peace can sometimes be interchanged depending on where, which, again, which denomination tradition you're coming out of. It is either the peace candle or it is represented as the faith candle or it is referred to as the journey candle, specifically talking Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. And so you have this idea of it being faith because Mary and Joseph had faith that they were going where God was telling them to go. Mary's super pregnant, but yet she's taking the, the journey anyway. Joseph is now having faith that what the angel told him is true and that this is God's child that Mary's carrying. Bethlehem is the place where faith is supposed the, the Messiah is going to be coming out of, and so there is faith that that is the plan. All these sort of things. The peace side of it does also go along with the same section of the story. Bethlehem is supposed to be a peaceful, quiet town. Mary and Joseph had the peace of God over them as they were approaching the city. They had the peace of God over them as they were going on this journey. Joseph and Mary both had peace and assurance that this was God's plan that Mary would carry this child and Joseph would raise it. So there are multiple aspects coming out of the different names for this candle that all still align us in the journey towards the Messiah coming, even when we disagree on what the name actually is. Yeah. So Brandon, what do we have for week three? Um, the third one here would be more of the joy, um, also known as the shepherd's candle, too. 
And why do the shepherds get joy? Because of their gifts that they're bringing to the king. No, that would be the kings that are bringing gifts. What do the shepherd? The shepherds receive the gift, right? They are the first people yes. to be alerted to the 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 birth of the Messiah. They get the joy of knowing that the time has come and that God is now on earth. They get the joy of knowing that we are one step closer to death being defeated, being freed from our physical state of oppression as shepherds being the lowliest of the low. But there's another reason why we have it as the shepherd candle, because who is the shepherd that is coming? Christ being the good shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd, right? And so we, again, have different aspects of all these different things of where Christ is ultimately going to shepherd the people. And we have joy in knowing that we have a good shepherd. Now, week four, Brandon, is what? Um, typically, that one is focused on love, which, back to what you said at the beginning, could also be focused on John the Baptist a little bit, too. Um, but also, I think this is the one referred to as the angel candle, too, more yes. symbolizing peace. Yes. So you've got two different aspects to this. Either this is peace or it's love. But it's focused in on the the angels' celebration. Week four, we are almost there. We've almost made it to the end. And week four, normally, this candle for some people does not represent peace. It represents panic because they didn't even realize that Christmas was next week and they still don't have anything bought. But <laughs> the the idea, again, is the fact that the angels have come and they are telling us that the king has arrived. The Messiah is here. But it also is the fact that every time the angels come to somebody, what is it that they have to say to them? I forget what it is. Peace be with you. Mm. I bring good tidings of great joy. <laughs> because it freaks people out seeing the angel appear. But yet the peace that comes with knowing that the angel has come to us with this message of great news also provides us with a sense of peace. It provides us with the sense of love. It provides us with the idea that God is back among his people again. Going back into the biblical history of all of this, 400 years of silence until John the Baptist, which is why you said sometimes it represents John the Baptist. 400 years of silence, and then suddenly God is back among his people. And God's not only back among his people, but this time God is himself coming to earth as well. And there is going to be peace among the people. Geopolitically, we understand that this also represents the moment within history that Jesus is coming. We talked about this during the 12 Days of Misfits last year in Daniel chapter 2, of the fact that this comes at a moment of, quote-unquote, world peace among the Roman Empire. And now Jesus, the Prince of Peace has come. Now, you already said that week five sometimes is celebrated and sometimes... Well, it's always celebrated, but whether it's celebrated with a candle or not is up for interpretation. <laughs> So week five is what, Brandon? Typically, that's the birth of Christ. Um, I don't know how other way to say it. <laughs> it's the Christ candle is normally yeah. what people refer to it as. And this one is not like the other candles. Why? Well, going back to the colors, because I don't think we actually touched base on it. So traditionally, because I don't know what the colors are. We already discussed that. <laughs> true. Traditionally, most of the candles are purple. Um Usually the joy candle is pink, depending or not whether that people do that, change that up or not. But then typically this candle, the fifth one, is white and it's usually in the center. And it normally is not a tall candle either. It normally fits real nicely in the reef and it's round and it's flat and it and it lights, it illuminates a little bit more. 
And it all is done to, again, represent the different aspects of what it is that we are actually celebrating. Why is the candle white, Brandon? I would say it could be a different, couple of different things. Um, just the pureness that God brings through the cleansing of sin. Um, part of it being the light of the world. Well, which I guess that's more of the symbol of the flame. <laughs> if you want to take a look at it that way. Well, it, it is it is related to the white also. These white candles that are round and normally the wick is underneath a little bit. When the flame is lit, it's not just a singular flame that lights up a room. It has much more of the effect that happens when you put a, a lampshade over a lamp. It illuminates more because of the way that the light is now spreading throughout the object that is lit. And so it is the fact that it's white is about the light of the world because it is now that the light has come into the world and the world now can see it clearly. Sometimes too clearly, which is the whole blinding effect, which is a whole nother <laughs> object lesson for another episode. <laughs> so keep going. You were going through the different the different colors and the different representations here. Oh, yeah. The other one I was going to say would be um, like Jesus is cloak or cloth that was laid was still left at the tomb uh, would be the other one I would throw out there. Expand I'm on that good. one. Cause I've not heard that one before. I guess that would, I'm just thinking of you're, you're laying down the old, the old cloth and just kind of that white pureness um, that is sometimes represented with the death. Um, I think that represents kind of a new, new birth in a way as well is how I would, New birth, new birth is one I've heard before, because normally that candle is only lit once a, once a year, one day a year. And so it always seems like it's a new candle every year when it's probably not, which is just a budget thing. But, um, you know, that that is something I have heard before, because that is what we're celebrating is the fact that we have a literal new birth in the celebration of the birth of the Messiah. But beyond that that birth is what gives us our, our the second birth that Christ talks about in John chapter three with Nicodemus of being born both of water and of spirit and the, the rejuvenating aspect of all of this. So Brian, the question then is why does any of this actually matter? It's a good question. Cause I think as you kind of talked about, there's not really, well, there's not a, there is a biblical context to this. However, there's not a biblical context to where these candles of this four set stages or five set stages that we talked about. Um, but it can very much be a heart posture for us during this season, especially what you talked about, the origination of it coming from more of a, a fasting approach, because if we approach this correctly, a lot of times the first two weeks are more of the reflection, um, setting our posture of our hearts, of looking back. And then we kind of look ahead a little bit too to, to what Christ represents there with the joy and the love. So I, I really think it's a good time to center our heart, hearts for this season and step back and reflect uh, versus getting caught up in a lot of the commercialism like you talked about. Well, I think that's the bigger thing for why it matters to us today is that like with Lent, it is a it is a preparation period for the worship of what it is that we are actually gathering together about. You know, like we talked about with the 12 Days of Misfits last year. The idea of what we refer to as Christmas is just one event. And it's one event that is just the starting blocks for 33 years of ministry and the ultimate event. But yet this event that we are talking about when we talk about Christmas and Advent is so much bigger than just the starting blocks towards salvation at the end. 
because it did actually start all the way back in Genesis. God was with us, and then we pushed him out. But now God is coming back and offering us a way back in. And so we do have to have these moments throughout the year where we do stop and have these checkpoints of centering our thoughts and our worship back on Christ and who Christ is and what he is accomplishing for us. Or else we are going to get lost, whether it's in the commercialization of Christmas stuff or whether it's in just the day-to-day activities of life, or even sometimes, and this is the case that we see a lot of the times within um, certain, certain areas of the Christian spectrum, sometimes it is a matter of even getting just lost within our own sin. Or getting lost in the idea of Christ's love. In a bad way, not mm-hmm. in the good way. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the other... the, these stopping points direct us back where we're supposed to be looking. Yeah. The other um, symbol that we didn't really talk about, I mean, it kind of correlates within the same is also the Advent calendar, which right. does traditionally start December 1st. Um, most of the traditional sense would follow, again, more of the 24 day period or for our sense with misfits here, we're going to do 12 days um, leading up to Christmas, but it is more of a habitual side of remembrance of some people will take daily verses leading up to Christ. Um, But then even within that, we see the commercialization of it of, all right, we're just going to open up this door and eat chocolate or having something else random that people give, receive a gift inside of too. Um, But yeah, so I guess the Advent calendar can be another representation of Advent, sometimes more on a personal level versus the big C church coming together to celebrate Advent. Right. The candles are much more about the corporate waiting. You know, we are awaiting our Messiah to come, both in terms of remembering him coming the first time and also him coming in the future. The calendar side is much more of an individual or a corporate family side of the waiting period of we are counting the days until we are able to celebrate this. You know, and, and I think that that's the the other side that separate that we we don't we didn't necessarily talk about here, but that we should actually also be talking about the fact that it's not just a counting down the days until the birth. It's supposed to be a counting down the days until a celebration. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an awaiting of a good thing that has come. Even when we talk about Lent, it's supposed to be counting down the days to a celebration, not counting down the days until, okay, now I can have a cheeseburger again. (laughs) You know, it's again about the heart posture and the focus behind all of this of worshiping in spirit and truth that we get out of John four of this idea of, we are centering our hearts back on the fact that Christ is at the center of this all. Whether we start the calendar year on January 1st, or we start it on November 27th, we are centering back on who Christ is. That's part of the fun thing within the the 12 Days of Misfits side of this, is that some of these passages that everybody just doesn't, would never say are Christmas-related, are very much Christmas-related because of the fact that when we actually look at it with this idea of we are awaiting the promise that that God is showing us in this. we are able to see how Christ has been in the picture this entire time. Hmm. Even when it's very annoying for Brandon trying to figure out how it all fits together. (laughs) So with that in mind, next week, starting on the 13th, which I think is actually Tuesday. Did we actually 
did the calendar actually work out in our advantage, Brandon? Is it actually it on a Tuesday? Out. Yeah, it is on a Tuesday, so it worked in our favor this year. Wow. That that's like it almost is like we planned it, but there's that this isn't. This is the calendar. Yeah. So December 13th um is going to be the start of the 12 days of misfit. So for the month the rest of the the calendar year here, you're going to be getting some daily daily doses of misfits that are between five, 10 minutes long, depending on how long it takes us to read the verse is actually normally what changes the time, time length. True. But we're going to, we're going to walk through and do a misfit style devotional um, of getting us to the point we talked about today of remembering why we are actually in the season to begin with. In the meantime, also, if you are still looking for the commercialized version of this holiday, <laughs> the Misfit store is still online, although your time limit to be able to get things before Christmas is probably coming pretty close. I don't remember what the actual timeline was, but um, go to the website, ministrymisfits.com backslash shop. You'll be able to see the all of the items. If you go to ministrymisfits.com and just go to the shop tab, we were able, Brandon, to finally divide up the store into actual categories as well. So nice. if you are looking for something very specific, go to the website, just go to the shop tab, and you'll be able to find what you're looking for there. But we also have a new thing this year, which is coffee. And so yeah. if you actually like coffee or tea or cocoa or cookies – Go to our website, go over to the shop tab again, and then you'll see a, a link that says Giving Bean. If you click on that, you'll be taken to our Giving Bean store. And Giving Bean is something that I used a lot of the time when we were doing youth ministry. And everybody that drank coffee said the coffee was amazing. But what Giving Bean is, is it's a coffee, tea, cocoa, cookie like distributor where you'll be able to order your stuff straight from there. They also do K-Cups. They do beans if you want to grind it yourself. They have coffee grounds. They have even, you can make your own K-Cup type things. Um, but 25% of any of the purchases that you make through Giving Bean will come back to Misfits to help us fund all of this. But it'll be delivered right to your door. And um, again, from what people that actually like coffee tell me is that it's really good. So... Brandon, did I miss anything? I guess the only thing, other thing would be thank you to those that did participate in um, giving month for the month of November to yes. help us give back to Tikva, the local organization here, and to continue um, funding Ministry Misfits Media. So thank you to those that did participate. And if you do want to help out more, uh, you can become a Patreon at ministrymisfits.com backslash is it right? Uh, now I'm forgetting what it is. Patreon. Patreon.com backslash mystery misfits I had is the, opposite. is where you got to go. Yeah. You had it backwards. It's okay. Patreon.com backslash mystery misfits. You said it right last week when I wasn't here, which is all that really matters. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, giving month is over, but you can still become a Patreon member. Um, and get all the, the fun exclusive stuff to that. If you're still wanting to give to both the misfits and to Tikva, um, the, the, the store still has the Tikva collection in there where the, the stuff that is bought through that will go back to Tikva. Um, you also can go, if you go to Tikva.org and go to their donate tab, they're in the middle of a campaign right now for Christmas time as well. So go check that out. Also, Brandon, this was uh, a little bit more of a head scratcher than you were hoping for, I'm sure. Yeah. But it was mm -hmm. just preparation for the coming fun in the coming <laughs> weeks. So hopefully we'll be back in studio for all that. We're going to get the studio all nice and spiffy again, just like we had it last year. So Brandon can pull out torture from That's his stocking, stocking instead yeah. of Andy. So in the meantime, we will see you guys next week. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. 
If you would like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits. 